would uh, would be remiss if we didn't bring up the next gentleman. I want to thank him for uh, coming out here to attend this with us. Uh, he is the inventor of the game we call Photon. He's the one that put in the effort to, to make this happen, spent a lot of time, really created the first commercial laser tag system. Uh, he's going to come up and uh, talk to you, and then I'm going to MC and uh, help him uh, answer any questions you guys have. So, George Carter, everybody. <laughs> did you actually open at while you were still a company of, under the name Photon? How many, what was the peak number of centers you had open? It was in the mid 40s that were actually open at one time. Uh, we actually sold 70 some franchises, but a lot of them made the franchise fees and never got open. Uh, but at the peak, it was, it was either 45 or 46, somewhere in that area. Uh, for the TV show, did you have a set schedule that you Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> yes? What was your favorite arena? Well, the Alpha Field turned out to be everybody's favorite. And yeah! That was, yeah. That was the original Dallas design, and we played hour after hour games testing the equipment in the arena, moving things around and getting it all to work. And then actually, even after we got open, we'd go in and modify stuff and move it around to get it all to work. So before the franchise ever got a blueprint, we had already moved things around to, to a great extent there in Dallas. Yes. Uh, what was your favorite arena? Uh, how did you get the sound? Where did you get the sounds and the rules from of the game? The sounds? Uh, you like the music or what? 
Well, how do we develop the rules of the game? Uh, it, we wanted to capture uh, the, the childhood game of, of playing cops and robbers and that sort of thing, because it's a natural thing to play. And we wanted to incorporate, capture the flag into it. So that's why you would attack the bases and try to defend your own base at the same time. So that was the basis for all the rules. And then after that, we just had to come up with a scoring system. Initially, everybody started at zero. So you ended up with negative scores. And we learned that if you would start at 200, you'd have less negative scores. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's kind of a hanging question for a lot of us. I mean, we took probably one meteoric ride and then kind of fell off. What, what, what would you feel was like the misstep in the Pacific sort of kept it from being one laser tag system? Um, a simple. Um, <laughs> no, no funding. I couldn't get money. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I spent half my time out trying to chase dollars, and we were never properly capitalized. Uh, we did the franchise system, which is really a bad business model. That's all the only thing we could do. And uh, I wish some of the bankers that told me it was a fad were here tonight. Scientifically, a photon is a particle of light. Is that with kind of input into which box you the name photon? No, it was our second choice. The first choice was laser tag. <laughs> Who came up with the uh, original idea for the design and the layout of the alpha field? Was it a collaborative effort? Yeah, it was collaborative. It was, it was pretty much um, pretty much my original idea to do the symmetrical field. And we hired some good architects and people. And we, like I said, we went and tested it. We had cardboard boxes. We moved around in the, in the arena area and did a lot of testing. And, and when it seemed to work, then we went ahead and had it built. The, uh, the music was produced by Ken Kalei. Yes. The uh, father of Colby Kalei, if you guys don't know, or we we finally seen that article on producer Fleetwood Mac. What was that connection? Well, the, my previous business in Dallas was a Grand Prix racetrack um, that was uh, invested in and funded by members of Fleetwood Mac and a bunch of other Hollywood celebrities. Uh, so for my connection there, when they invested in that, they had the uh, part of the investment was the property that we bought, bought a, a million dollar piece of ground. And a year and a half later, somebody offered $4 million for the ground. So obviously they sold it. Um, and I was out of business at that point and had to do something. So that's when I started Photon and went, went to see Ken. And uh, I said, we create some futuristic sounding music. And he did a great job. I think, I mean, you heard it today a lot and it, it still sounds good after all this time. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Jarre, <laughs> Rendezvous. Um, is, can you say anything about how that became part of the... Well, you know, everything was, was, uh, was science fiction back then, so we wanted to use the new age type music. So that was one of the, the, the good cuts we could do, so we played that a lot. Yeah, yeah, it, was, it, was, it wasn't floaty new age music, it was kind of heavy and intense. It really hit you when you came in the door. Well, the whole idea of Photon was to be very immersive. Yeah, we didn't even know what that word was then, but I knew it needed to be uh, somewhere you could go and, and, and really get into it and really believe it. And I think that's why there's so many people here tonight, because it worked. We did some, some testing with, uh, with handicapping and that sort of thing, and I think the main thing was the fact that it was symmetrical. Uh, it never gave one team an advantage or another. So I think the symmetry is a big part of it. And also the observation deck was very important, and the two, two yeah. level playing field. Uh, remember, nobody had ever played at first, and to get people to go in there, they had to understand what they were getting into. So I, I think that the observation deck was a big part of that. Yes, thank you. Lighting, the molecular lights, uh, the market.
where there are multiple um, save rendered uh, versions, or pretty much what we see now is that were there things before that? Ideas or that, that was done by my architect, uh, a guy named Buddy Collins, and we were basically had run out of money about the time we were putting up the lighting. Uh, the budget was extremely tight, and uh, he, he uh, took some PVC pipe and a saw and started put some slots in it, and uh, we had some inexpensive uh, plastic bowls made uh, that we cut holes in, and it, it worked great. It actually, you know, put lights on the walls. <coughs> It was very inexpensive. Yeah, I had a very good architect there that uh, actually did the construction work also. Some people may, some people may know this, but um, during the intruder alert, was it really supposed to have been attacking players from uh, like a game laser in the uh, ceiling, say? Everybody believed that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never did. We never had to do it, and it wasn't it wasn't necessary, so we never did. Okay. Never actually attacked anybody. But was it was it planned? Was it was it? Yeah, it was sort of planned. But, okay. You know, since the the regulars learned it didn't happen, and <laughs> new people coming in thought it did, so it was kind of. One of the soundtracks. Um, some people call it the dance track. Some people call it track eight. I know that at various times it was track six. Uh, it depends on what CD each facility got, but it was kind of a more of an upbeat track. And it sounds to some of us like there's some synthesized words in there, although we can't quite make out what those words are. Oh, no. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Play, play, those words play it backwards. Are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that. Yeah, maybe if you played it backwards, you'd hear that. Uh, nothing was intentional. I sat in the studio the whole time it was being done uh, with Ken and uh, Gary Chang, I believe, the guy that was playing the synthesizer. So. So there's there's no real words. It's just some, something we're imagining as we listen to play our folks. Somebody <laughs> figures it out. Let me know. I listen to it all the time because it's like two separate things. I hear the words traveling up to the stars, and then something going back and forth. Play more folk time. And, and, and the very end of it sounds like it's saying like it's trying to get on. More tricks for that man. It says play more folk time. It says play more folk time. I'll give Ken a call and see it. <laughs> uh, did you expect it to take on uh, the league quality or the, or the competitive quality that it did? Yeah, it was originally intended to be a, a competitive sport. That was a whole idea. Our players were all uh, 18 to 30 in that range. It wasn't a kids game back then. We allowed the running, we encouraged all that. Uh, yeah. The leagues, yeah. we did I hired somebody. Uh, background they set up the league play and set up the brackets and did all that and then as far as uh, the, the different uh, league players challenging one to another and traveling to other photons they, they did it on their own so a lot of that happened that's all you know in the back GJ. if the alpha field was your original field design what made you come up with the other different styles of fields uh, kind of the franchisees wanted wanted to change up on it and then we started doing the double fields so we had to get a different style there so we, we did the omega field which was it's similar but uh, the alpha field still ended up being the best we didn't really spend as much time testing the other field yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> the battery was a problem. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other equipment was fairly heavy, but uh, it was a battery problem, and there weren't any better batteries then. We didn't have lithium ion at that point. Good work, guys. You said some of the characters were still named after real players, and so you remember them. And also, one of them for sure, Mason. First of all, was it okay? Right. Yeah, that was his player name. Bethan right. went yeah. by an actual. It wasn't his real name. Bethan Miller. It was his actual name, and he was an employee there. <laughs> we didn't have a man there. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So after uh, 30 years and everything you've seen this weekend, any desire to take another run at it? <laughs> yeah, you got some money. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do differently, though? Yeah. Well, it'd be a lot easier now with the you know, good electronics and all that. And uh, there's some things you could do. You could do some unique things. I'm working on a military version right now that's uh, uh, you know, it's a, a serious, real version to replace the miles system that we use right now. 
Was there ever a bigger fields than Wildwood? <laughs> we never approved Wildwood. <laughs> uh, I heard it was spectacular, but I don't know how well it played. It's huge. Did you ever go there? No, I never made it to, to Wildwood. I, I made it to probably more than half of them. That's what I heard. Of, of the places you did visit, was there one that sticks out in your mind as, oh my god, I can't believe they built this place? No, not really, because you know, we were trying to promote the, the, the company line and, and build the fields that we said to build, because we knew they played better, and some of them were more spectacular. The one in Japan was probably the most unusual that I saw. It was you know, all stainless steel. It was really, really amazing. Good time for about uh, one or two more questions. Scott. So I was actually just about to ask you, you know, how did the field in Japan come about? How, what was the connection there? How did that get over? Was that through the TV show? Or? No, um, it's unrelated. We had some uh, U.S. representatives who were uh, Japanese Americans that put the deal together, and uh, we we suggested they follow the you know the, the franchise rules, but uh, they just built what they wanted. And I didn't see what it was until I got there. I spent about ten days over there during the grand opening time. Bob, go ahead. Uh, I I always admired the game design of. Um, I thought that it was a good game if you translated it into a tabletop game with dice and pencils and paper. I thought it would still be a good game. And there's a couple of unique things about it. Um, the concept of clearing that forces you to spread your fire throughout the opposing team and so it's a particular player. And also the high value base that happens when a game. Do you have anything to say about just the game design? Well, we tried to do what toy companies call play value. It's something that's just kind of natural that kids like to do. And if you like to do it as a kid, you'll like to do it as an adult. So the, the basic cops and robbers game that all kids used to play, and capture the flag was another version of it was a regular game to fit into this very well. And we came up with things like the clearing because we found out what happened if somebody would follow the same person around shooting him over and over. Uh, so you, you know, like what happens when you play laser tag other places. Yeah. 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 So we developed that as we went on, and we played a lot of test games before we were open uh, to try to work all that out. All right, last last question. So, uh, really, just a comment. I just want to say thank you, um, and that also it was a great workout. Um, we we ran the field and that six and a half minutes with 13 pounds of equipment, uh, you know, I think my, my resting heart rate was probably in the low <laughs> 60s when I was a teenager and uh, and we just had a great time and I thank you very much for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.